will be debating, discussing and celebrating blackness within the TV, film and theatre industry. So I just want to start off with Miss Sharon D. Clark. <laughs> uh, what, may I ask, what are the most notable changes that you have found um, within your time in the industry from when you started to now? When I started, the only black folk that I saw on telly was Derek Griffiths mm -hmm. and Foyla Benjamin in Play School. Mm -hmm. That was it. That was it. And then when we started to see more black folk on telly, they were on Crime Watch. They were <laughs> <laughs> then they started serving food at McDonald's. But that was it. So for me to now turn on my television set and see black and white couples, mixed race couples, black couple brushing teeth, buying carpets. <laughs> you know, that's important. Because I didn't grow up seeing black people doing normal stuff like that on telly. Buying the carpet, looking at a dishwasher, walking the Do you know what I mean? So I have seen a progression, although it feels like it has stood still. It's 30, 40 years. But seeing that progression where it is now normal, that I am not calling my friends going, there's a black person on telly. Because that's what we used to do. You'd pick up the phone and go, black person on telly. Watch. <laughs> And the crime watch, you'd be watching it. I don't have to do that now. So that that is progress. As slow as it may seem, we have some progress. So we have to acknowledge that. Are we there yet? No. But we've come far. And we must recognise that. So for the younger people who when you switch on your television you never think about it. That's progress. Do you know what I mean? So we I just say let's acknowledge that. Can you just tell us a little bit about your training when you were first starting out? If I never really trained. Yeah. <laughs> um, I went to Ivy Travers Dance School, which is in Clapton, when I was six, and a friend of mine was going, I was like, Mommy, I want to go, I want to go. <laughs> so I went to Ivy Travers, little old Jewish lady, with an array of children. They black, white, Iajan, cerebral palsy, they were disabled. You're laughing for there was a child with cerebral palsy, why are you laughing? I don't understand that. What am I saying? No. It was your fan. I was a fan. and did my first show at Bow Civic Centre and just fell in love. Just, this is it, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to be. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm a little black kid from Tottenham, but I'm going to find a way. And I, I stuck with Ivy's from I was about six till 18. And we did pantomime, we did variety shows. Um, so my love of panto comes from Ivy's as a, a, as a genre that introduces children to theatre mm -hmm. and gets them in and gets them participating. They don't just have to sit back and let it wash. They are active. So something like pantomime I absolutely love. I mean, I've come across wonderful people every day of my life who uplift me, inspire me, challenge me, make me soar. And my road has been beautiful. I'm not going to sit here and say I have struggled and it's been hard and as a black woman in this industry, all oh, the trials and tribulations. It's not been like that for me. It's been wonderful. Have I had steps along the way where I wanted to kill people? Yes. That's all I have. And mostly in issues of makeup and hair. Today, day, I'm like, come on, people, 2018, we are yeah. on the frontier of time, yeah. and all the people still don't know. Yeah. 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 Why aren't they training these people? No. So I did, um, what did I do that week? I did the Lenny Henry show, and the makeup woman asked me, can you send me a picture to see what your hair is like? So I said, oh, let me be good. So I took a picture of me luck, so I sent her and I also took a picture, I sent her a picture of me and Caroline. Now, it's, if the Caroline picture is me dressed in a white maid suit, with my hair in a week, with the basket I wash it. So it's like, you know, this yeah. is not me in my house. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I sent her the two pictures, and she sent me a text back saying, Do you still have dreads? 
like, <laughs> I really have to explain to this woman now. You are a makeup artist and you can't see that that is a set up shop. You think that's how I sit in my house? It's a lace front wig! Put the big one back so I wash it. A lot happens so much. Um, in in theatre, you can generally get away and do your own kind of thing. In telly, I've always had to do my own hair because I sit down in that chair and I sit there and go. And it's it's just frustrating. And when when I was at the national, we did AMA corner, and they were saying, well, you know, for you girls who've got your heads in dreads, I call my hair locks, but that's fine. If you've got your heads in dreads, we're just going to roll your hair. I'm like, that's not period. Are you going to put a wig on Marianne? And Marianne's got short hair. You're going to put a wig on her? Yeah. I said, you're going to put a wig on my ass. <laughs> you're not just going to roll my hair, this is period. And she's like, oh, well, it's too expensive. And I'm like, it's expensive. And you go upstairs to the National in the wig making department and you see them up there, mm -hmm. PNC, yeah. strong mm -hmm. by strong, <laughs> so you know, the here and to do with them. Hey, yeah, yeah. But it's too expensive to get a wig. And I was like, okay, if it's that expensive, I'll go to PAX. Yeah. I'm naming and shaming. <laughs> the head of the department said to me, well, if you want a wig, you'll never get a wig under that, so we're going to have to cut your hair. Oh, I'm like, are you telling me or asking? <laughs> because you are a little Italian man, and you don't know fuck all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so ask me a question. So he was like, no, you're going to have to cut it. So I'm like, okay, fine. Went to Berks. Put time in the cool wig. <laughs> Put time in the wig. And he was walking past as I was putting on the wig. I said, hmm. And I wore that wig for the show, and then when I went back and did the 50 years of the national anniversary, they called me up and they said, you know that wig that you wear? Do you think you could bring it back? I'm like, yeah, you have to charge, you have to charge, you don't have money. And when they come back for every man, you know that wig that was that same wig that you wasn't going to buy? Yes, me have it. Give me some money. Can I ask, because earlier when you mentioned that, um, well, turning on the TV and seeing black people was rare, but however, when you went into the, the training that you did, there was an array of races. Do you feel like, well, clearly, it didn't match um, the amount of talent versus mm -hmm. what we were seeing? Gloria, do you feel like now, um, given the current influx of black shows that are now available, do you feel like what's happening in drama schools is representative of that? Do you think it matches? Okay, so here's the thing. I, I think one of my main issues is that it's, yes, there are shows which are predominantly for black folk or people of colour, in inverted commas, but, but, but they tend to be sort of isolated, particular kind of shows. Yeah. So it will be, you know, you know, I know lots of people here have been in these shows, so you know, but it will be your line hits, yes. you know, it will be your Motown, yes. it will be the stuff which is based on African-American um, mm -hmm. That's yeah. from the 50s and yeah. 60s, yeah. not even Black, not even Black current, no. not even yeah. current African-American yeah. experiences, yeah. if it has to be African-American. Yeah. And they tend to sort of be like, oh, we'll do one show, and we'll put you all in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're all satisfied. Yeah, yeah. And I think the issue is, is less about having a show with lots of black people in it or Indian people in it. I mean, that Bombay Dreams, remember that? Mm. Yeah. Um, and you know, and <laughs> <laughs> my face shows everything. So. Um, and um, you know, I think for me, it's more about the fact that in drama schools, you'll have an array of people, you'll have different. You know, you'll have a, your black brother, you'll have your, your brown skin brother, you'll have your brown skin sister, your brown skin, your black sister, you'll have your Indian sister, you'll have your Chinese sister, you'll have your whatever, you'll have a whole array. And I think the idea is, is that you should be able to take all those people who are predominantly born in Britain, have actually had the same 
cultural experience in terms of schooling and, and growing up together, leaving aside your heritage in your house, but we've all had pretty much the same kind of experience. So you should be able to tell any story. So I feel like there are, we get sidelined in a way where we get put into a box and kept there. And I think some of you, I didn't actually go to drama school. Um, I started at 17, so I was very really young, but I know lots of people here I've spoken to when I've worked with them jobs have said to me that they were told that they wouldn't, couldn't do this speech or they shouldn't do this or they weren't going to work in that or, you know, if you look like that, you're not going to, you know, you should just concentrate on singing the effy white stuff yeah. um, and not look at Carousel. Yeah. Yeah. When it is a lot. You know, and I, and I think, so, so, so for me, I mean, I've sort of gone around the houses a little bit, but it's, it's, it's a bigger, it's more about, it's less about different coloured people and more about the fact that we're all British, most of us, have all had the same cultural experience as such. Yeah. And I think for most of us who are here, we all know that when we walk into a room, the first thing that they see is you're black. Mm -hmm. And it's literally just having a conversation on the way here, because if you're in the diaspora, you're not, you're just you. Mm -hmm. You're just Sam, or you know, or you know, uh, Shaggy, or you're whoever, but you're not black Shaggy. You know, I'm the black woman Gloria that performs. You are, as such, you're always that, and I think that's the issue that we have here, yeah. mostly, is that we're sidelined because we're <clears throat> any other shade other than white mm -hmm. and put into that box, but we're also not included in the British experience. Mm -hmm. And that's why we don't filter into the rest of the stuff in the way that we should do. Well, as you've spoken, does that, that make sense? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. 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 It, it makes perfect sense. That's why it brings us greatly into the next um, topic, which is about the um, the fact that a lot of black theatre or black television tends to be, again, focusing on the African American story rather than the black British. And you know, mm. I, I've said it loads of times. How many more Twelve Years a Slave can I go and see? Yeah. How many more? Um, it's about the stories that are being commissioned, but I want to go over to Cedric and a lot of our artists, our British artists, are moving over to the USA for saying there's not enough work here, but you did the opposite move, so I'd love to hear about the African-American experience from an African-American. Um, first of all, um, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, this is going to sound so strange, um, I consider myself a black American. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, I do know that um, my heritage is um, from Africa, but I'm a black American. The British theater experience, the ooh that just came over the audience when Gloria mentioned black African American shows like Motown, uh, telling us those shows over here, uh, which afforded uh, so many British um, artists the opportunity to be on in the West. Um, but there's a certain Know the word I'm looking for. Um, there's a certain, oh, if we're going to tell our stories, does it have to be a black American story? Um, that, that I felt coming over here. Uh, my first experience over here was um, doing um, a controversial opera um, <laughs> um, in the musical theater world, which is the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. Just because it's, it's telling our story uh, from the Gulf point of view uh, in the 30s when everything was, yes, my uh, step and fetch in. You know, um, not so eloquent. Um, and I, one of my first experiences in that room, in that rehearsal room, we were rehearsing a scene <coughs> where the detective in the show, who's white, comes in to the community to find out who killed this, this character, Crowns, um, and approaches Porky character, who's a cripple. Um, and this white cop comes into this room with all these, people, these black people in this room, and um, the director, Tim Sheeter, who's a, a, a white cripp, um, was trying to figure out how to address the scene and the militant um, young boys and young men in the show, like David Albert, who's one of my, my, my best friends now, and, and J.D. Marsh, uh, who were in the show. The, the cop comes up to the, the guy in the scene and he goes, um, well, I'm not gonna take you to jail, you know, because you did it. And all the guys, David and, and all the young black Brits in the show were like, no, we're gonna stand up, we're gonna blah, 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 and then I hit, it hit me 
instantly that my experience as a black American is totally different from my experience as my brothers as black Brits. Mm -hmm. um, that my understanding of the civil rights movement, uh, which is I'm one generation removed from that, um, is totally different than the black Brit version of our same movement, the civil rights movement. So um, why I think that if you go to America and Broadway and you have a British accent, two points, two points anyway. I'm not um, saying anything about anybody's talent or ability on, on the other side of the pond. But there is a thing where if you go, if you come from Britain and you go across the pond, you have an accent. Well, it's the exact opposite over here. I was in Motown for two years and it took um, almost 18 months before I was stopped, referred to as the American in the building you know, in that show. I mean, I, and that was very offensive. Not Cedric the actor, not Cedric, you know, Cedric the American, you know. And so I feel like, whereas, Brits think there's more opportunity going across the pond. I think um, Europe has been very kind to me as an artist. Um, there have been experiences um, where I was denied an opportunity to even be in a room because I was American. But um, in America, I couldn't even get in those rooms. So, <laughs> so you know. Um, Has anyone on the panel considered or currently considering moving to the USA for artistic reasons, and why? Yeah, um, you know, Daniel keeps asking me if you've got your ticket, if you've got your ticket. Um, it's, I, for me, I think it's because there are certain kind of roles that I get fixed into. Um, and I've also had a lot of things that have been brought, like some cell tapes to do from the States, that I've been asked to do, that uh, I read the scripts and I go, oh my God. It's like I'm just playing a normal person. Like uh, you know, one of them was for uh, one thing that I'm looking to go and do is a, a show for One Way, which is going to be off all way, and it's um, about a geophysicist called Naomi who happens to be gay who's going to Mars. And that's it. And that's it. Now it would be black. Black. <laughs> the first thing for me. Yeah. Exactly. I very, very, very rarely, maybe exactly. once or twice, get a script that just says the character is. Is yeah. this? Mm -hmm. And it's my, my size or my yeah. color. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's and that for me is a that definitely having been doing this now, you know, I look here. But, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> for, for 18 years actually, because I started when I was 17. And I've seen the business change because of that. Um, I just realised that 34, I was like, I just, I want to actually just play a part that isn't Nala in The Lion King or Whitney Houston's role in The Bodyguard or like, I just, you know, I, I, I want to just be a person. I want to play people and tell real stories. And I feel like that doesn't come around a lot for us here. Um, and I'm quite specific looking too, so I think that goes against me a lot. I'm, I'm right for very good particular things, but here it tends to go against me a lot. I'm too striking. People don't like that. It's, and, you know, <laughs> listen, but I'm, I'll own it because I'm, I'm too striking. People, they don't like it. They, here, they don't like it. I but every I do. Do. But I Every Do you think because the, but then all the Americans I work with, they love that. So and they seem to really embrace that about me. So I find it so it's interesting because I think, yeah, the grass is always greener, right? You know, it's that kind of old age old thing. But I sort of think I'd like to be around some like minded people. I um, think, sorry, sorry, sorry to jump in, I was going to say, I think, oh, the, magic of, <laughs> I think the magic of being in a different um, different situation, a different area, is that what you're allowed to do is have all of the experience that you've had of all your years within, um, you know, within theatre, and then 
be a completely new person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Completely mm -hmm. new mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's what the, the, the appeal of, of going over across yeah. the, the mm -hmm. bond is because you you suddenly come out of nowhere. As far as these people are concerned, you, you're out of nowhere. Yeah. 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 You're like, oh my gosh, who is this? Mm -hmm. and, and going back to the point of grass always being greener, mm -hmm. like for Americans, a British accent sounds incredible. Mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I, I think I think I'm going to say that. The same as here, vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we really love an American sound. Mm -hmm. It's just got so much greener being able to recreate yourself, and I think that's what yeah. you is. Yeah, and I think there's also, but to sort of like to attach to all of these points, you know, the grass is always greener. I, I do realize also that in this, you know, we are, like Sharon said, we've come a long way as a, as a country in terms of representation, especially mixed representation. See, a mixed couple on screen here is way more like I went up for an advert the other day. And I was like, I'm not going to get this because I was in there and it was for an American um, cough product called Mucinex. <laughs> <laughs> not going to get that because I was like they just I ran my cousins in the states and I was like they don't really show that many mixed couples on screen like that whereas over here I know that if I went up to something and I was reading with a, a white brother or something I know that that's a, way more of a possibility than <laughs> than it is in the states so so that so adding to that sort that's of a thing, money thing yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. a money thing that's the yeah. business part of show yeah and I sort of think so you know when I'm saying grass always green it is but I mean I I think for me personally, and I think everybody has to just be really specific to themselves and their own individual experience. You know, I feel like it's something that I would like to do just because I just want to get out in the world a bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I said, you know, there's a whole diaspora out there of people who are doing great things. And, you know, I follow a, a Nigerian uh, uh, short film company that they like, do this stuff on Instagram and you know I changed the face of my Instagram to seeing more black faces doing amazing things but from around the world and these they're killing it and they look amazing and they're, what they're doing is amazing and it really excites me on a daily basis to see that so I, I want to work with those people because that's the future that's the world you know you know but, not just here well I will say this what it also does um, I'm a late bloomer I moved to New York when I was 36 um, and my first Broadway gig was in Porgy and Bess in the ensemble. And so um, in the ensemble, in Porgy and Bess, all the Broadway casting directors and, and, and theater people got to know me. So I was, got to know, be known as a very good ensemble member. And nothing against the ensemble, I'm not saying that. Those are the hardest working people in show business. Yes. <laughs> 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 Calm down. Calm down. What I am saying is that coming over here, my first my first two roles over here were um, Sport Life in Corgi and Best and then Barry Gordy in Motown. So um, I'm accepted over here as a leading man in theater, whereas in the States, um, I'm, I'm an ensemble woman. You know? so, so coming across the pond has gotten me to leading man status, which means if I go back home, which I'm not planning on doing, <laughs> go back uh, to the States, then maybe they'll, they'll consider me as a leading man over there. Yeah. That, that yeah. Makes yeah. Sense. So we're just going to take a little five minute break. Thank you so much guys. Uh, please drink, eat, be merry and we'll be back in five. Oh, yeah. <laughs>